1990, Italian priest of the Paulines, Gabriel Amorth, published a book detailing his experiences with exorcism and sharing his knowledge of demonic possession. Amorth was a top exorcist for the Diocese of Rome and co-founded the International Association of Exorcists, which is always looking for new members due to increased demand for exorcisms. Apparently this year was a record high for possession, so if that's always been an interest of yours, go apply. Don't do that, that was a joke. Amorth's book, An Exorcist Tells His Story, gained him worldwide recognition and his experiences with demonic possession have made him a valuable source for Hollywood. In fact, at the 2011 premiere of the film The Right, starring Anthony Hopkins, Gabriel Amorth was brought in to introduce the film and give his seal of approval. This was also the same premiere where he said yoga and Harry Potter were satanic and insisted that all Eastern religions were likely to cause demonic possession. In his book, Amorth detailed the methods of exorcism exorcism, the stages of possession, and other frequently asked questions regarding diabolical phenomena. One of the answers he gave was in regards to the ritual of exorcism up to and including what gets to be called an exorcism and who has the ability to perform one. Jesus first gave the power to cast out demons to his apostles, then he extended the power to the 72 disciples, and in the end he granted it to all those who would believe in him. This power which Jesus granted to all those who believed in him is still fully effective. It is a general power based on prayer and faith. It can be exercised by individuals and by communities. It is always available and does not require special authorization. Taking that into consideration, it's really no mystery as to why and how having faith in a horror film centering religion, specifically Christianity and even more specifically Catholicism, is akin to having a superpower. Even without Hollywood or horror, having faith, no matter the religion, is always spoken of as having a superpower. Father Gary Thomas, the subject of Matt Boglio's nonfiction book, The Right, The Making of a Modern Exorcist, had this to say on the matter. People say to me all the time, I don't want this to happen to me. I tell them that as long as you have a faith life, a prayer life, and a sacramental life, the chances of this occurring are very nil. If you have a life that involves God and for a Catholic, if you have a sacramental life that involves the Eucharist and reconciliation with regularity and your life is lived in the spirit of the will of God and the providence of God, you do not have any serious consideration to be concerned about. And as a hero with a superpower, you have a responsibility to protect those who are defenseless and in these movies, the defenseless are most often, but not always, those without faith. In the first installment into the Conjuring franchise, Patrick Wilson's character, a fictionalized version of the very real and very problematic Ed Warren, visits the family to see if their home is indeed being haunted. Once he catches wind of there being demonic activity in the household, this exchange happens. Have your children been baptized? Uh, no, we never got around to that. We're not really a church going family. Well, you may want to rethink that. By including this, writers Chad and Carrie Hayes continued a pre-established theme often showcased in Catholic horror. The people who end up in these situations are usually there because they either don't have faith or their faith is wavering, and those with stronger faith have a responsibility to save them. The rule is changed a little bit with the nun, but not because of intention, just a general lack of narrative development, but we'll get to that later. William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist, famously adapted to film in 1973, follows Father Karras in his wavering faith and started the entire genre. When we're introduced to Karras, he confides in a colleague that he feels unfit to be a priest and that he's experiencing a crisis of faith. After this, his sick mother passes away, which shakes his faith to his core. The exorcism of Reagan McNeil and the terror experienced by those around her is not just about them, it's a test of faith for Karis, and when Karis begins to believe again, it is only then that the demon is exercised successfully and Karis sacrifices himself in a show of resolute faith. At its core, it is a story about the meaning of faith, the challenge of believing, and the battle between good and evil. The exorcist is the blueprint, and all these bitches are her sons. In the aforementioned film, The Right, we follow a young would-be priest who is reluctant to move forward in joining the church for a few reasons. He doesn't feel worthy and his faith is wavering. It isn't until after one failed exorcism and one successful exorcism that he feels his faith being restored and happily joins the church. The source materials author, Matt Baglio, said writing the book was something of a passion project. And when you look at his other works, that becomes 
glaringly apparent. He credited the research he conducted with strengthening his faith, and in an interview promoting the book, said that having strong faith was the most important thing for an exorcist. For an exorcist, having a strong faith life is like putting on a suit of armor, and many have told me that they just wouldn't be able to do what they do without their faith. However, that doesn't mean that they don't also value reason and intuition. All of these things make complete sense, especially given the subject matter, and actually in any horror subgenre, having belief in the thing that's terrifying you or terrorizing you is the first step to actually defeating it. Whether it's finally believing that there really is a serial killer on the loose and that that serial killer really is looking for you and your friends for vengeance, or believing that your house is haunted or that a demon is possessing your loved one. Where there's room for doubt, there's room for fatal error. I hate to say this, I really do, but it's kind of like with the bye-bye man. I, I'll, I'll see myself out. The bye-bye man is a terrible movie with the premise akin to lore we see in films like It. But in the case of It and bye-bye man, believing in something and fearing that something is what gives it power. I am the writing on the wall, the whisper in the classroom. Without these things, I am nothing. 20 years later, when the Losers Club is all grown up and they successfully defeat Pennywise, part of their success is because they are no longer afraid, and the other part is that they pretty much bully it to death. Their fear gave Pennywise power. With the Bye Bye Man, just thinking of him and saying his name is enough to make him manifest, but it's the fear of him that makes him real. Horror movies dealing with faith have two sides of the same coin. You have to believe in the evil in order to defeat it, but if you don't also believe in the good or believe in in your own strength, you can't defeat it. The Exorcist Believer is the worst movie I saw this year, which is very impressive because Marlowe was holding that title for eight months. It was lazy, it was uninspired, it wasn't scary, there was never any tension, and even though we are dealing with the souls of two little kids, somehow there weren't any stakes either. But there was something interesting in it. At the tail end of the film, a priest tries to perform the exorcism even though his church or, or Vatican or, I'm so sorry, I'm blanking on the terminology right now. They didn't actually approve the exorcism. For a while, he sits in his car before gaining the courage to go in despite the disapproval of his superiors and he immediately just gets molly walked by this demon. I mean, he gets fucked up. Obviously, when I saw this, it was pretty apparent that part of it has to do with faith. But after doing more research and hearing what different priests have had to say on the subject, I found an interview with the once president of the International Association of Exorcists, Father Giancarlo Gramolazzo, which shed more light on the topic. The importance of nomination by the bishop comes from the power of the prayer being tied to the church as well as to the obedience of the exorcist. As the current president of the International Association of Exorcists, Father Giancarlo Gramolazzo says, I always use this phrase, the prince of disobedience is the devil, and you beat him by being obedient, not by your own personality or charisms. According to Father Gramolazzo, if a priest were to perform an exorcism without the approval of his bishop, the prayers would still work to some extent because of the power of Jesus Christ's name, but they wouldn't have the same effect on the demon because essentially, the exorcist would be praying the ritual in a state of disobedience, and the demon would know it. Some priests have tried to perform an exorcism without the bishop's permission, and the demon said to them, you cannot do it, you are outside your diocese, and you don't have permission. So there, that's one thing about the exorcist believer. That was neat. But something tells me, given the quality of the rest of the film, that one interesting part was not intentional. This was a full-on accident. David Gordon Green, we need to talk. The Nun, much like Exorcist Believer, is a terrible movie, only less offensive than Believer because The Nun didn't have the gall to waste Ellen Burstyn's time, but it's okay, y'all. She got that bag. You can't talk about religious horror, specifically Catholic horror, without talking about The Exorcist. But for me, I also can't get into the nitty gritty of it without talking about The Nun. It was this movie that made me want to pursue this topic anyway, mainly because it's so badly executed, but also because it deviates from an established theme in these movies. Well, kind of. <laughs> to preface, The Nun is a terrible movie that if you haven't seen, I sincerely believe your life might be better for it, and I would implore you to just continue living such a good life. 
Because you got a good life. In this movie, the nuns living in a Romanian monastery are all decimated by a demon named Valak, who's played by Genovian Whitby royalty. Valak is taking lives and taking names. The last of the nuns takes her own life to avoid being possessed by the evil entity. And that's when a priest, a nun in training, and some guy go to investigate. This setup is so funny to me. An established priest goes to investigate what happened at the monastery and he recruits a nun in training and then they're joined by a handyman. I know he's their tour guide because everyone else is afraid and he found the body, but still, it's funny. Shortly after they arrive, they discover that the nuns are praying day and night in intervals just to try to keep Valak at bay. Irene, our nun in training, joins them in prayer, which could be interesting because it would play into the theme that prayer and religion is the power given to those with faith to ward off evil spirits, except it's later revealed that everyone in the monastery is actually dead and has been for a long time, and Irene was just praying alone. Whether the story is trying to suggest that her faith was stronger than everyone else's, or that faith alone can't save them, it's rewriting the theme which is interesting for a subgenre that could use some fresh approaches. But it's also one of the many reasons I think The Nun is a failure of a story. Given that the haunting takes place in a monastery really flips the trope of the faithful having little to worry about on its head, and all the nuns having been killed off screen before the last one takes her own life drives this subversion in. No matter how much faith you you have, sometimes bad things still happen. But a subversion like that is nothing without another subversion. This film could have really played with faith, religion, isolation, and all of that, but it didn't and it's lazy. But it must be mentioned because it's a great example of one of the rare deviations we have from the standard Catholic horror formula, a formula so tried and true that having a new approach could only benefit the genre. And having a new approach shouldn't be that hard given the fact that, well, Catholicism and horror, they kind of go together. Catholic horror is really just a natural result of making supernatural horror about ghosts and demons. You can't truly acknowledge the existence of hell without somewhat acknowledging the existence of heaven. You can't acknowledge the existence of the devil without acknowledging the existence of God. So for many storytellers, delving into tales that contemplate an afterlife, a thing that none of us can actually see, entails contemplating faith to some degree. These stories aren't just constructed in such a way for us, the viewer, to suspend our belief, but they are often done through a character whose faith is wavering or whose faith never existed. Even supernatural horror movies that are mostly removed from the specific genre of Catholic horror have to contemplate faith and skepticism. Stephen King's 1408 and the remake of The Haunted Mansion, strange thing to mention, I know, both follow two skeptics whose skepticism has been calcified by a devastating loss of a loved one. For John Cusack in 1408, it's the loss of his young daughter. For Lakeith Stanfield in Haunted Mansion, it's the loss of his wife. Their experiences with the paranormal and making contact with the other side changes them in many ways, for the better, and in both instances, having faith and belief in an afterlife is what helps them to process their grief. The idea of what happens after we die has permeated both religious and secular schools of thought. For those who follow a religion like Catholicism or Islam, thoughts of the afterlife come with images of punishment, fire and brimstone, otherworldly terrors, and just pure bliss. Take the Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch, for example. His paintings often included images of the afterlife, images of hell, images of nightmare scenarios, and Christ himself. Bosk was raised Catholic and grew up in a sect called the Illustrious Brotherhood of Our Lady, but even if I didn't tell you that, I'm sure that just by looking at his work, you would be able to tell. From the numerous paintings depicting Jesus like Christ carrying the cross, Christ crowned with thorns, and the adoration of the child, to Bosk's series depicting the deadly sins and the afterlife like Hell and the Flood, The Last Judgment visions of the hereafter, an allegory of gluttony and lust. His paintings are dark not just because of the apocalyptic visions they depict, but because his depiction of humanity isn't very flattering. He saw a dark side of human nature that made him kind of a cynic, and you can see it in his work. One viewpoint shared by most commentators is that Bosk does not provide a very flattering view of the common man. He was, in many ways, an elitist. People are depraved, fallen. And although redemption is possible through Jesus, Mary, and the saints, there seems to be little hope for it. Bosk's heavens are always empty, and his hells are full. 
Bosque also did many paintings depicting the revered saints, Saint Jerome at prayer, Saint John the Evangelist on Patmos, and that's yet another element to the horror that already exists within Catholic history, the origins of the saints. Many saints die martyrs, often persecuted for their religion or persecuted by their religion. Joan of Arc remains a famous example of a person who was both condemned and canonized by the Catholic Church. The same church that executed her also made her a martyr. Who killed Hannibal? Who killed Hannibal? Joan of Arc was famously burned at the stake, but the story of her death and eventual sainthood is only one of many with such brutality. Saint Margaret Clitheroe pressed to death by the weight of 800 pounds. Saint Bartholomew flayed alive. Saint Lawrence roasted alive. Saint Lucy eyes gouged out. The lives of the saints were often brutal and torturous, which ended up inspiring another unique take on Catholic horror, the 2008 French film Martyrs. The concept of this film is often written off as straight up torture porn, but there's an element to it that many people overlook, which is the religious aspect of trying to reach the afterlife or trying to reach God through unbearable pain. For the characters to use pain as a means of getting closer to God without dying for it, it closely resembles the absolute torture undergone by canonized Catholic saints, and even within the film, these characters are inspired by the stories of Catholic saints. At one point, a character is tortured by being flayed alive, much like the aforementioned Saint Bartholomew. But some of the saints' brutality isn't in their death, but in the context of their history, including Kateri Takakwitha, the first and only Mohawk person to ever be canonized. The story of her journey, including her eventual conversion to Catholicism, is very different depending on who who's telling it. And this has to do with a different kind of Catholic horror than what we've been talking about up until this point, because now we get to talk about the Doctrine of Discovery. The Doctrine of Discovery was a document that basically gave Christian explorers the right to claim any land that was uninhabited by Christians, obviously meaning that if any non-Christians were already on the land, the explorers had every right to displace them or convert them to Catholicism by any means necessary. Despite there having been millions of indigenous people in America at the time of the arrival of Christian explorers, their land was deemed to be terra nullius, or a land without a master, because they weren't followers of Christ. The doctrine was used to justify colonialism, exploitation, and in numerous instances, slavery and genocide. Then made its way into the United States federal law in 1823 when it was used in the Supreme Court to dispossess native people of their land. It wasn't until March of this year that the Catholic Church and the Vatican officially rescinded and denounced it. Never again can the Christian community allow itself to be infected by the idea that one culture is superior to others or that it is legitimate to employ ways of coercing others. A lot of the religious horror we see, especially from the Catholic perspective, has a tendency to vilify other religious sects as lesser, with Catholicism often being the only way to achieve purity and safety from evil. Paganism opens the door to evil, Hinduism has been used in a similar fashion, and the practices of Romani people are the cause for the Lamia curse that drags Christine Brown to hell. It's interesting to see movies about the Catholic faith, especially when we get something that plays around with the concept a little more than what we've mostly seen, like when we get a Martyrs or a Prince of Darkness. Faith is such a universal feeling, and I think even for those of us who don't necessarily subscribe to any religion, faith is still a universal concept. Whether you're having faith in a higher power, faith in yourself, or faith in the unseen and the unexplained. And the great thing about these movies is because the core of it is rather universal, you don't need to be Catholic to be entertained by them. Also, they're just creepy. I don't know, a lot of Catholic imagery is creepy. That being said, it's always nice to see different kinds of religious horror. Like, Under the Shadow shook me to my core when I first saw it, and even though it's not overtly Islamic, a lot of the background involves Islamic history, and it takes place during 1980s Tehran, so of course there's a lot of it in there, and it hits a little close, and it freaked me out, okay? And there are a few Jewish horror films that I've seen, like The Offering and The Vigil, and the opening scene of A Serious Man, which I, I seriously think of it as a horror story, that part. And all of that just tells me that religious horror, no matter what kind, is always going to have different kinds of stories stories to tell. And when there are so many ways to go, we cannot let things like the nun continue to be okay. We just can't. There are plenty of movies that I don't get around to mentioning, and normally people get kind of offended when there's not a mention of something they think 
should be mentioned, but don't worry, it's not because I didn't want to mention these movies, I just wanted to try to keep the essay a bit focused and not just a montage of going, and then there's this movie, and then there's that movie, and then there's this movie. But if you're interested in the uncut version of the essay that I originally wrote, which delves into the Catholic Church and their many, many scandals as well, including the fact that Father Amorth also claimed that the sex abuse scandals which engulfed the Catholic Church in the US, Ireland, and Germany, and other countries was proof that the Antichrist was waging a war against the Holy See. Um, you can subscribe to my Patreon. I'm gonna put the full unedited essay up there. It kind of sounds like the writings of, um, I don't know, someone receiving some sort of psychic message from someone in a different dimension. It's very rambly, but if you're interested, it will be on Patreon. Thank you for watching, and happy Halloween!